A very dangerous blame game has developed with the United States current administration blaming China for not being forthright and forthcoming with their early coronavirus data coming out of there. Of course, we all knew that was bunk right at the beginning. Hello, everyone. This is Chris Martinson here with your SARS-CoV-2 daily update, April 1st, 2020. No, I'm not going to put any uh, April Fool's gotchas in this at all. It's too serious to do that. But it is day 69 of my reporting. So I've got, I have brought in Kevin from the office to uh, to provide some commentary on that. And if you don't understand that little joke, I, it's not for me to explain it to you. Let's go to the numbers. All right, right here, uh, United States. These are, again, from yesterday. Uh, so that would have been March 31st. And so why I'm doing that is because we get a whole day's worth of numbers. If if I pulled up today's numbers as they exist here at 1.54 in the afternoon as I record this, there's holes all over it, and it gets harder to sort of interpret them. So I know it's a day old, and this thing is moving so fast that uh, by a day later it seems hopelessly out of date. But you know, I think the United States is well over 200,000 cases now, uh, for example. So what I've done here is I've added a couple other columns. And what I'm looking at here is the case fatality rate, which again is the deaths divided by something, the total cases. There's a couple of case fatality rates we could be looking at. The first is what I'm going to call the on the run case fatality rate. And so that would take total deaths and divide it by total cases. Why on the run? Because these cases are still on the run. They are not resolved. They are, they are, there are many people who are in this column right now who have been detected as positive. A proportion of them will suddenly slip over at some point and become serious or critical, and some proportion of those will die. And so the on the run is kind of one of your lower numbers that you can get um, in this series because as things resolve over time. And let me use, say, South Korea as an example. South Korea has uh, relatively few cases coming on board. They've got a really good containment and manage, uh, handle around their particular sets of cases. And so they have 162 deaths here right now. So if we said, well, what's the total deaths divided by total number of cases of 9,786, you get around 1.7. It's just a little under that, 1.6 something or other. All right, so let's call it 1.7. We'll round up. That number is the floor. This number can only go higher. Why? Because there are still uh, some people over here in serious or critical, right? And there's uh, some people over here who are still active. Some of them are going to slip over here and become critical. And a few of those are going to slip over here and die while this isn't climbing by all that much. Although 125 has started to climb a little bit again. So we'll see what, what comes of that. So I would suggest this is the floor. And when we look at their total resolved cases, though, now resolved is a different sort of a case fatality right here. What we're doing is we're taking deaths in the numerator. The denominator is going to be the total cases that have resolved. There's two case ways you resolve. You either recover or you end up dying. That's a resolution. Both of those are resolutions. So the resolved case fatality rate is to take total deaths divided by total recovered plus total deaths, because that's the complete population. And here we see what these numbers look like. And these are obviously, um, uh, and they just, again, are giving us some different information from this, but also not the correct information. Um, why? Because, again, this is an on-the-run number. A lot of people are going to slip from being a total case and go straight into recovered without ever becoming either critical or dying. But still, for countries that are a little bit further along, and South Korea is really far along in this story, where you see they actually have very low critical um, cases left. They have a lot more um, uh, recovered cases compared to that. So they're pretty far along, and I think we're starting to get a, a number that that um, resolves around that. And here we see their resolved case fatality rate stands at 2.9%. Um, is that an upper bound? Maybe. So maybe we would think the actual case fatality rate truly is between here and here for a super well-run country that did a lot of testing, caught people early, and didn't see an overwhelmed hospital system. When we go to countries with overwhelmed hospital systems, we get very different numbers. Let's look at Italy and Spain as two examples of what I'm talking about. Italy with an overall on-the-run case fatality rate of 11.7%, Spain at around 8.8%, but look at their resolved case fatality rate, 44.30. The truth for these countries is probably going to land somewhere between these two numbers, um, given how they're testing um, and given how they're recording people. Now, it's always possible 
that the numerator is badly underestimated because Italy and Spain have not done enough testing to discover, for example, that they have four times as many total cases as they thought, uh, something like that. But uh, in the absence of that, we have to go with these sorts of numbers. So this gives us a little bit of a sense of of really where we're at. And the idea that we're going to settle somehow at 0.1% or 0.2%, I really don't think is, is being uh, refl- borne out in these numbers yet. But we still don't know the proper numerators in all of these cases. All right. And Germany, I think, is going to provide us a closer example because they're doing 500,000 tests uh, per week now. And, you know, they're, they're detecting lots and lots of cases, but many of them tend to be mild. So fewer deaths and uh, fewer people in a serious or critical state compared to the overall number. I mean, here you can see France with 52,000 detected cases has nearly twice, uh, or actually that is twice, um, twice the number of serious or critical cases. So it's suggesting maybe France is detecting half as many people as Germany is. And I'm not suggesting Germany's catching everybody, but they're clearly doing a much better job uh, than many other countries. So these suggest that this is actually a very serious illness and something we should take quite seriously, and it's not the flu. All right, the blame game has begun, and uh, here we saw Dr. Burks uh, claims the U.S. was slow to respond to coronavirus outbreak because China withheld a significant amount of data. And no, this is not an April Fool's joke. Um Yeah, so let's read in. There's an article that goes with this link, and here's what's in that article. It says, Dr. Deborah Burks, response coordinator for the White House Coronavirus Task Force on Tuesday, suggested that the U.S. was slow to respond to the Wuhan coronavirus pandemic because of faulty data reported by China. When you looked at the China data originally, with 50,000 infected in an area of China with 80 million people, you start thinking, of this more like SARS than you do a global pandemic, Burke said at a press conference. The medical community interpreted the Chinese data as this was serious, but smaller than anyone expected, she continued, because probably we were missing a significant amount of the data. And now we see what happened to Italy and we see what happened to Spain. Burks was appointed to the task force on February 26. Let's look at this right here. That is so late in this story. Oh, my God. We had so much data by then. This whole idea of saying, you know, China wasn't giving us the good data. That's why we were slow to respond. Let let me let me just remind everybody again. Here's what I managed to do with a hundred nine dollar a month Internet plan. All right. I managed to figure out that I should be tracking this in the week of January 13th. I issued an alert on January 23rd. I said this had all the hallmarks of being a true pandemic. Uh, released a video on the 24th warning everybody about this. On the 27th, I declared this is a full pandemic, called for immediate halt of all flights from China. On February 2nd, reported on its asymptomatic infectivity and the implications of that, noting that if you have asymptomatic infectivity, good luck trying to stop this thing. The only way to do that is you've got to stop everybody. And I was really complaining at that point in time that the United States by that time had put in place the screening, air quotes, I'm, way, I'm wiggling my fingers in the air, screening at airports where they were pointing those little temperature guns at people's foreheads and calling that a screening. Well, you can't screen that way for asymptomatic people. That's what I was noting at the time. And then on February 4th, I noted, of course, China was fudging data at, by quadratic fits, but it was even earlier than that. I think it was by the February 2nd or 3rd. One of the things I was deeply concerned about was there were all these incredible citizen videos coming out of China in the Wuhan hospitals showing bodies in the hallways and and people pitching over in the streets and all that kind of stuff. And then they stopped. And that was my first clue that we had a big problem on our hand because China was using their firewall to suppress that sort of information. So by deduction, I was able to conclude that China was not being honest about this and was hiding data and they were doing it for political reasons. If I knew that, how is it possible a presidential task force as late as February 26 is now trying to come back and revise history and claim, well, you know, we were looking at China's data and, you know, we didn't really know, you know, because they were kind of fibbing to us. Uh, no, I don't think that that holds any sort of water here. All right. And I want to ask here now, what's the point? What's the point of spending hundreds of billions, if not trillions over many years of dollars uh, of having this massive security state if it doesn't provide any security? Well, just today, Uh, The U.S. um, intelligence community came out and presented a report last week to China, I mean, to to, uh, Trump about China, saying China concealed extent of virus outbreak, right? 
China has concealed the extent of the coronavirus outbreak in his country, underreporting both total cases and deaths. It suffered from the disease with the U.S. intelligence community concluded in, in a um, the U.S. intelligence community concluded in a classified report to the White House. Well, this is a CYA time. This little cover your ass moment here. The officials asked not to be identified because the report is secret and declined to detail its contents. But here they are leaking it. But the thrust, they said, is that China's public reporting on cases and deaths is intentionally incomplete. Uh, So here's the thing. Who cares what China's public reporting on the cases was? You are the intelligence community. That means you've got everybody's phones tapped and you've got those wicked cool satellites and you can listen in on conversations between Chinese officials and you can scour the internet just like I was doing and you probably have access to much better data than I had. So the idea that that the intelligence community is saying, you know, China was being intentionally incomplete with its public data. How is that even news? How, how does that even CYA in this particular story? I don't get it. So continuing on, Deborah Burks, the State Department immunologist advising the White House on its response to the outbreak, said Tuesday that China's public reporting influenced assumptions elsewhere in the world about the nature of the virus. See the little dodge there? China's public reporting influenced assumptions elsewhere in the world. We don't care about that. What about our private understanding through our security state about what China was actually doing? What about that? Because I'll guarantee you, we had plenty of great information about just how serious this was. You know, China, when they're when they're going, oh, my gosh, let's build a 10,000 bed hospital or whatever they were doing, you know, those thousand bed hospitals. Right. Certainly we were listening in and uh, certainly we had uh, transcripts of those phone conversations. And certainly it was noted that they were doing that because there was this really bad mnemonic plague running around, if you will, that um, uh, that was killing people. And they were very concerned about it. So. This is a dodge to say certainly, you know, China's public reporting influenced assumptions elsewhere in the world. Who cares? Uh, That doesn't that shouldn't matter at all. The medical community made interpreted the Chinese data, Chinese data as this was serious, but smaller than anyone expected, because I think probably we were missing a significant amount of the data now that we see what happened to Italy and see what happened to Spain. Yeah, but um by February 26th, this should have been completely obvious uh, what was happening, right? I mean, just completely obvious because I was pointing this stuff out. That's why I put the timestamps on here. Uh, by the time you know you've got asymptomatic infectivity, which was coming out of scientific reports out of China, by the time you know you have aerosol data, you don't need China to tell you anything. You have all the data you need to determine this is a very serious thing and we should take it very very seriously. All right. So this idea that there was just no way of knowing, you know, and uh, China concealed extent of virus outbreak, U.S. intelligence. I just want to point a couple things out. I mean, just to remind everybody, because this is how my brain works. I remember stuff for a long time. Remember when the NSA, it was pointed out that uh, had tapped the German chancellery uh, for decades, right? Um, including Angela Merkel's phone, right? Uh, was actually tapped. This came out in the in in 2015. So you, if you think the NSA was was busy uh, and the CIA were, were busy tapping even the the phones of our allies, our closest allies, back in 2015, what are the chances they weren't all over uh, what was going on in China? Uh, zero. Yeah, right. You just have to. I mean, just come on. That's just logical. Uh, as well, we noted uh, back in 2013, it came out that the NSA has been monitoring calls of 35 world leaders. Right. Um, so so we know we have these capabilities and the idea that, oh, you know, China was publicly saying some stuff that really threw us off because because that was the only information we had is completely so ridiculously unbelievable as to be insulting. Uh, uh, it, it's 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 like it's like when your your seven year old comes in and just gives you one of the worst lies. You know, you can just see right through it. You know, it's you're, you have a decision as a parent. Are you going to. Are you going to laugh right then? Are you going to take them seriously? Are you going to, you know, call BS on their little charade? But um, this is a this is really weak, weak, weak uh, uh, sort of lying. But it's a dangerous form of lying. Why? Because you get things like this, like this guy Bill Browder here, who is the CEO of Hermitage Capital, head of Global Magnitsky Justice Campaign, so so very politically biased, obviously, and author of Red Notice. Uh, I assume so. Yeah, obviously, uh, somebody who's got um, uh, been carrying the anti-Russia thing for for the state. According to U.S. intelligence, China lied and concealed the extent of the coronavirus outbreak. That bad data led to a less extreme public policy response all over the world, which ultimately led to misery and death everywhere. Um, 
Yeah, Bill, here's the thing. Anybody who was believing China at that point in time was uh, being hopelessly naive. Of course, China lies about stuff. Uh, France lies about stuff. The U.S. lies about stuff. You always have to look past what uh, is being officially said, and you've got to use your intelligence to peer a little bit more deeply. So any country, I would flip this on you, Bill, and I would say any country that based its entire policy based on what the, China was publicly saying was a very ignorant, unsophisticated country. So that's you really shouldn't be saying that about your own country. I don't, I don't agree with that. All right, uh, but here's where it gets dangerous, of course, right? Ben Norton writing the new Cold War is on. Cold War 2.0 was entirely avoidable. Remember, it doesn't have to be this way. But bipartisan support brought us to this dangerous point. Now the responsibility of all peace-loving people who don't want World War III is to support diplomacy and dialogue with China, not more aggression. So here's what that aggression looks like. I spoke to two senior White House officials this morning. Both made it clear when coronavirus spike passes. The administration will take the gloves off on China. One explained Trump is furious and wants action. So you can see the blame game now. The blame game is not that the United States failed in its duties to, uh, you know, think for itself, which is actually what happened. So this is a bad interpretation. But now is looking to blame China around that. And I do think China has plenty of blame. But let's be clear. Uh, the United States has plenty of blame and should look in the mirror first because because – I did all this with a $109 a month plan. I didn't have a trillion dollar security budget. Come on. This was a failure. There were failures here. And uh, trying to assign the entire 100% of the failure to China wouldn't be any good. So if this was a court of law, you know, if this was a car accident and it's being uh, litigated, then you would find out that uh, you could assign percentages of blame, right? It's not black or white, your fault, my fault. It might be 72% yours and 30 uh, you know, uh, 28% mine or whatever. Okay. At any rate, I, I just, I just thought that all needed to be pointed out because I, this is actually something that I am talking about over at peak prosperity. And this is something I'm very concerned about because this blame game could lead to this thing that nobody wants, right? World war three, right? We would very much like to avoid that. And so this is not the time for, um, uh, pointing fingers like this. I don't believe. All right. I keep saying plant a garden, and here's part of the reason why. A very helpful article in the New York Times just came out on um, March 31st. Will the coronavirus threaten our food? Two important points in here, uh, both of which I've, I've pointed out, but I, I love uh, this is I love it when somebody else does it. Uh, it makes it easier for me. Uh, so they were just talking before I clipped this piece about how imports are at risk because of supply chain disruptions, because, you know, ports are closed down, because warehouses are closed down, things like that because of coronavirus cases where they've just shut facilities down. Another threat they're pointing out here is that those nations and others will take steps to protect their own food supplies. Last week, Kazakhstan, a major exporter of wheat flour and Vietnam, the world's lar third largest supplier of rice, suspended exports of those products. Because the United States no longer holds national grain reserves, significant parts of the food supply could be jeopardized should food protectionism accelerate. Look at this. No longer holds national grain reserves, just like we didn't hold PPE reserves. This is like really dumb stuff. It's, it's, you, you save a couple of bucks on it, right? Um, but it's funny. You know, the United States doesn't have a cup, literally, in the scheme of things, a couple of bucks to have a grain reserve, to have a PPE reserve, to have any of that stuff, to, or, or even to maintain shelters for people. Anything, I'm not going to do any of that. Um, but if we have to ship uh, another few billion dollars of, of weapons to Ukraine, somehow that gets done by Tuesday. So it's just priorities is all. So I just want to point out that this is another one of these priorities that may well influence your future if you're, you are in the United States because the United States has made the decision to no longer hold grain reserves, and uh, that could have an impact. Two terminals for the Port of Houston were shut down for a day this month after an employee tested positive for coronavirus. And Pennsylvania briefly closed most of its truck stops in service areas to slow the spread of the virus, also threatening to also slow the distribution of food and other goods. Some meat packagers around the country were at three-fourths capacity because of illness. In these and other small ways, the coronavirus has begun affecting the nation's food supply chains, raising the potential that as the virus spreads, it will become harder to get food into stores from both American producers and the ones abroad. So far, the worst of the problems in the United States have been temporarily empty shelves at some stores. But the consulting company Fitch Solutions says that it sees risks at all levels of the supply chain from production to trade. 
And that could lead to a re-acceleration in food price inflation globally. Yeah, totally could. So uh, risks at all levels of the supply chain from production to trade means, uh, first, it's uh, we heard about, and I, I've been talking about how there are um, people who are the temporary visa holders who would come into the United States to help the planting of vegetables, say, up in uh, California's Central Valley, right, where you know pr- roughly half of the nation's vegetables come from, or the third, some huge number like that. Without the spring planting in place, you don't get the later summer and fall harvests and things like that. So I already think that there's going to be shortages of particularly of fresh vegetables as well. People may not trust those fresh vegetables too. Things like lettuce, I don't, you know, uh, things that are like tomatoes or avocados that I can, you know, put in a sink and wash easily. Yeah, absolutely. But um, those other things which you're intending to eat raw and somebody might have handled, mm, not so much right now, which all leads to this idea. Hey, plant a garden. And yes, this is the garden that I planted at my old house. I'm busy creating a new one. I'm going to create a video series of that. We're basically starting from raw land and and uh, this is what it's going to look like at the end of a year or two um, because I'm a busy boy when it comes to these sorts of things. So I'd love to put that out there, show you what the transformation will look like. All right. Uh, very quickly, I just want to talk about everything you need to know about the economy is contained in this one chart. This is a chart of West Texas Intermediate selling for less than $7 a barrel. I think if you were putting it in a barrel, an actual barrel, it would, the barrel would cost more than the oil itself. Crazy. This is crazy. From 60 here, um, right here, that's the 60 line. And just look, that's unbelievable destruction. And oil is selling below $10 a barrel at key American hubs. Of course, first thing, this is happening because there's too much supply now because demand suddenly went away. And um, why did the demand suddenly go away? Because streets suddenly became like this all over the world. These are pictures from all over the world. And when you see an empty street like this, what you need to think about is all the economic activity that's not happening as a consequence. It's not just the oil that isn't getting burned to move the cars up the road or the or the trucks. It's all the goods and items in the trucks that aren't there going from point A to point B. It's all the intermediate goods that aren't being fashioned into finished goods. It's all the people who aren't traveling from point A to point B, where point B is where they're going to recreate, to entertain, to get a meal, to buy something, to do something economic. This is just a massive economic shutdown, and it's all over the world. This is Las Vegas over here, uh, Italy over here. Um, just this is what it looks like all over the place. So when you look at these empty pictures, and it's fun, you know, the, the photographers sometimes have to wait a long time to to get that one person in the picture to give it some some reference frame, right? So so they wait. Uh, it's not like there's always one person in the streets. Um, it's just how they like to how they like to take their pictures, of course. All right. Uh, That just means a lot of economic activity isn't happening. So I said, if you just needed one chart to know everything about the economy, it would be this one, or perhaps just something like this, where we understand that oil demand is going to drop by up to 17 million barrels per day, says uh, one analyst here. Here's another point of view that says it's going to drop closer to 19 million barrels a day. This V-shaped recovery where it just dings right back up is uh, very hopeful. I'm going to imagine, I actually, my personal view is it, it kind of, it's going to be a longer, slower sort of a thing like this. Um, because everything that we're seeing about this virus right now is going to take a long time to get through this. And when you, this level of demand destruction for oil, because oil is part of every single economic transaction. There's not a thing you can look at right now in your room that didn't get there somehow because of oil. And if you think you're clever and you look at yourself and you think, ha I didn't get here because of oil. Understand that out of every calorie of food you eat today, there will be 10 calories of fossil fuels hidden in that somewhere along the way in the planting, the storing, the moving of it, the refrigerating, the, the cooking, on and on and on, right? So um, when you see this level of demand destruction for oil, it's really economic demand destruction that you're viewing. And this chart alone tells me how bad things are going to get and things are going to be, this is Great Depression level of economic demand destruction right now. And if it V bottoms, you know, it's still going to be very painful. If it's a longer, slower trough bottom, like I think it's going to be, this is going to be worse than the Great Depression in most, in many ways. All right. Remember to resubscribe. If you've been accidentally unsubscribed, please help us and hit the like button. It's that little thumbnail, thummy thing right there. All right. Conclusions for today. Uh, the blame game. It's a foot. I think it's unhelpful. It's a COIA effort. It's also just wrong, right? Uh, to say, oh, we, we we couldn't have done any better than we did if only, you know, we would have maybe. 
but only if China had given us better data. Look, we had all the data we needed. Um, that's, that, that's indisputable at this point in time. The blame game is also geopolitically dangerous. And remember, China is going to be in a very destabilized place right now, and their leadership is going to be um, – very, if they're very much looking to not be absorbing any more blows at this point in time, and if they have the opportunity to rally the cause of their people against uh, the foreign devils who are blaming them for something inappropriately, um, they will play that game, of course. And so we would be stoking any time we're doing this blame China effort here. I think we're just stoking some dangerous geopolitical tensions. I wish it weren't that way. I think it's energy misspent. Because uh, we have a lot of other more important things to be doing right now. But that seems to be uh, there's a lot of energy in the system here in the United States and maybe elsewhere for um, for the blame game right now. So I, I think that's – I'm worried about it. Food insecurity, it is a growing threat. Just plant a garden and really start learning uh, secondarily after that. Once you have the, plant, the garden going, I'm, we're going to be talking more about storing food. And what's interesting is if you went back just 100 years ago – Everybody would know all about storing food and um, how to, how you would preserve food for the long winter. And if you went back 200 years, everybody knew how to grow it, store it, all of that stuff because that was life for humans for all of history until very recently when um, when fossil fuels came along and allowed us to operate a little bit differently. But we're going to get reconnected with our food here. And food is, of course, the primary source of energy for human life. And so – uh, planting the garden is step one. And then step two, we're going to learn how to uh, store that and uh, put it in uh, jars and canning and drying and freezing, all kinds of things, right? This collapse in oil demand, though, all you have to do is look at this collapse in oil demand and you will understand that uh, this is really speaking to a Great Depression sort of a GDP decline. And this isn't just a GDP decline. The Great Depression uh, was bad, but it wasn't that bad compared to what could happen today because – they didn't have that much debt in the system. Today, we've just loaded with debt. And uh, when debt goes bad, it tends to implode and it tends to risk the system. And so we'll talk more about that as time goes on. All right. You know what? I watched this blame game and it just occurs to me, you know what? It doesn't have to be this way. I watched the bailouts going towards the same leverage speculators, 0.1% clever crowd that are too clever for their own good because they keep blowing up the, their themselves and threatening to blow up the whole financial system and they keep getting bailed out. You know what? It doesn't have to be that way either. We don't have to do – there's no law that says we have to do things this way and it doesn't have to be this way. That's the movement that I would like to see get started is thoughtful, reasonable people who reject doing things the stupid way. Uh, you know. And by the way, bailing out the same corrupt players who get in trouble over and over again – is, is stupid. It's a stupid idea because it means you just fundamentally don't grasp incentives, outcomes, moral hazard, human behavior. All right. It doesn't have to be this way. We can do better. And that's where my hope and optimism comes from is that I know we can do better and that we're going to do better. And so with that, thank you very much for listening. We'll be back with you tomorrow. Hi, folks. Adam Taggart here. Chris Martinson and I are the co-founders of Peak Prosperity. If you want to get alerted whenever we release a new video from Chris, just click the red subscribe button right beneath the YouTube video player. Once you've done that, a little bell icon will appear right next to it. Click on that bell. It looks like this. And that's it. The next time we publish a video from Chris, you'll immediately receive a notification from YouTube. Thanks for watching our videos.